It has been a long time. It has been way too long. So, and I know it's the end of January, but I can say Happy New Year to you, buddy, and welcome back. What a pleasure to have you on the program, Graham Agars. I've been sitting in your green room waiting, mate. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a long time. Oh, it's been such a long time. Um, but let's, let's, just, let's just do some housekeeping before we even talk about the tennis. Where have you been? What have you been doing? Um, well, actually, we had a massive year in the US last year. We, we left Florida, sold our house there after 34 years of ducking hurricanes and moved to Arizona. Uh, no hurricanes in Arizona, but just brutal, brutal summer heat. But we're happy to be there. My wife, Catalina, um, family lives there. Her parents and her sister are there. So it's her turn to be close to them. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm cutting back my time on the road, as you know. Yes. And just picking and choosing my events, which I think I've earned the right to do after 40 years. Uh, Gray, I was watching um, uh, ESPN earlier in the week, and um, there must have been a golf tournament. Was there in Phoenix or in Arizona? I mean, just the view, those mountains. I love Palm Springs. I love Phoenix. I love that part of the world. Yeah, it gets stifling hot during the summer, but you don't tend to have a winter, do you? No, it's beautiful. Um, if you can put up with a, you know, June, July, August, September, uh, the the reward is just fantastic weather for the rest of the year. And, and even when it's brutal, I mean, we're, we're talking forty three every day, uh, and and probably high thirties overnight. But it, as they say, it's a dry heat. It's de- desert weather, so you can get dehydrated there in a big hurry because you don't sweat like you do in Florida. You know, where the humidity is ninety five percent. Yes. Uh, so you you can really get caught out there, and it's going to take a bit of getting used to, I think. But it's not going to stop me playing golf, and it's not going to stop me enjoying the area because, like you, I love the deserts. Uh, you still got the the place in Adelaide as well. Yeah, we keep that, and uh, our daughter lives in Australia, so you know that keeps us coming back down under, uh, especially for Christmas and the New Year each year. But um, basically, we're we're Arizonans now. Let's talk about the Australian Open then. I've got so many questions to ask you about the quarterfinals today. Uh, but about 20 minutes ago, uh, every day around about the 3 o'clock news, we always reflect on something historical that has happened in sport. And it just so happened to coincide, 1983, the day a 26-year-old Swede retired from tennis. I know that you're all over this and remember it well. And I was saying that it was such a surprise at the time. We'd had a couple of the women players burnt out, but for a guy at 26 with you know, with as much success as he had, Bjorn Borg quitting. Can, you know, how much of it do you do do you recall now? No, I remember people were stunned, and and the the person who was most stunned, believe it or not, was John McEnroe, because for McEnroe, Borg was the guy that got him to the level that he got to, and he made frequent approaches to Borg um, after that announcement of a retirement, saying, "Please, please come back." You know, because I want to compete against you. Even though you beat me half the time, I want you out there. And Borg was steadfast. You know, he he burned himself out. He just didn't want to have uh, any part of it. And, you know, Borg's game relied on being ice cool and super concentrated. And you can only do that for so long. Um, Eleven majors testament to how effective he was. Uh, and, the, and the nearest thing to him uh, in recent times is Ash Barty. He got to the age of 26. Uh, won Wimbledon, won the Australian Open, and said, I've achieved all of my goals in tennis, I'm out of here. And that stunned people when she made that announcement as well, just like Borg. Borg never never came back. I mean, he tried a fleeting comeback. And I remember uh, interviewing, in fact, I I spent an hour with him at the ATP. We were supposed to have a, a conference call, and for some reason the phone stuffed up, and it was just me and Borg for an hour. And the most interesting uh, question and answer I had with him was what's the difference between then and what's the difference between now and he said back then I never thought I just reacted that's all I did he said now talking about when he was trying to make his you know um, brief comeback he said now I panic when the ball comes over the net because I don't know what to do so I mean that that just explained everything that explained to me why he retired because he just couldn't maintain that intensity, um, even though he still loved the game. Graham Agus is with us on the platform. How good was he, Graham? And I was talking to Lachlan about this today, trying to explain five Wimbledon's, six French. I mean, just to think that you're going from the clay to the grass and winning both. Couldn't get the US Open. And bizarrely, he hardly ever played the Australian Open. So there's a couple of questions. Why was that? But also, how good 
was he? And and you know, just in the in the in the pantheon, the greatest names in world tennis. Where does he fit in there? Yeah, he's got to be really close to the top. Um, I mean, he had an unusual game. Played with a weird racket, long handed, uh, long handle wooden racket. You know, very small sweet spot. He used to string it at eighty pounds. He used to string them uh, the day before his matches, leave them lined up along the hotel wall where he was staying overnight. And the ones where the strings hadn't broken were the ones he used in the match that day. I mean, Crazy. that's how tightly that wow. thing was strung. Um, but uh, but uh, he was a superb athlete. I mean, his speed was stunning. Uh, his inherent understanding of how to win points in the game, you know, got him all of those victories. And he almost got the US Open, but McEnroe denied him uh, a chance of doing that. And I honestly don't know why he didn't play Australia. I mean, Australia was either at the very end of the year or the very start of the year, the very end really for him. And, and he'd had enough tennis by then and couldn't be bothered coming down. But had the Australian Open had had the facilities and the reputation it has now and Borg was playing now, he would have come every year for sure because if you wanted to be considered the best, you had to come down here because everybody everybody who was something in the game was coming down. But, you know, I, I, I've seen Borg since. I mean, he, he, he turns up at the tennis every now and then. Um, he's been broke twice over. Yeah, yeah. He got so bad. At, at one stage, he had to sell all his trophies, and uh, Andre Agassi bought them and gave them back to him. Oh, what a cool thing. Um, yeah, it's just amazing. But, you know, he was a freak. He was a freak of nature. And... Um, he was a king of clay until that bloke Rafael. Yeah, that's right. but when you you know in those days in 1983, you know he had won 11 Grand Slams. I mean, at that stage, were any of us ever thinking, Gray, that somebody would go on to win 20 something? Um, well, it was it was hard to say because um, you know Rod Laver could have won 30 of them, but he got caught up between the you know the amateur and the pro thing. So his his number of 14 really was you know, a bit of an aberration, really. So I always thought, you know, a full-time pro, let's say he stays fit, like, a, a you know, Novak Djokovic or someone who plays every major, he's going to get his fair share. So I always thought that 20 was a reasonable number. Um, 30 would be absurd. Um, but, you know, these guys, these guys are total professionals now and they're, they're out there to win titles and and that's their main goal so i wasn't surprised when you know fed and the boys started getting in the high teens and around 20 but um i'd be interested to see how much further we go than the, the 21 that rough has got graham agards is the guru major championships um and the golf the golf major championships and the tennis grand slams for decades we've been working with graham you know, when you when you compare, and this is why I love talking to you about it, because you you know you just have so much history uh, uh, in the game. Um, when you compare errors with errors, um, how how do you actually do it? Because I, I you know I kind of think okay, you talk about the greatest player of all time, and I look at Rod Laver, and I you know I think the same as you. There were six or seven years where he was banned from playing Grand Slams. He won a Grand Slam, all four of them. Six years not playing, wins another one. I mean, what could he have done in the middle of that? Is it about competing against those in your era and that's all you can compare? You go, how good were you playing against the people that you were playing? Because how on earth do you compare Pelé with Messi, with Maradona? How do you, know, how do, how do you compare any of these great sports people, Will Chamberlain with Jordan and so forth in basketball? How do you compare mm. the tennis players? Yeah, I, I, I've come to the conclusion, having talked to a lot of people, including players, uh, and the players will all tell you, you can only beat the person on the other side of the net. You don't get you don't get to pick and choose your opponents. That's just the way the game works. So you can't compare eras. Um, but w then you then you try and get well, who was the best player overall? And um, a lot of people go for Labor because he changed the game really. You know, he top spin, backhand. Um, he could play from the baseline. He had to, but most of the most of the tournaments were on grass back then. So he was a superb. Um, you know, serve and volley, and 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 he was so talented with his hands. You would just have to suspect that if he grew up in the modern era, he would be able to use those hands and produce the game that these guys play with. Although his big disadvantage would be he's not six foot one, six foot two, six foot three like the the modern tennis player. But you know, I'm, I don't want to pick a favourite. If 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 you um, if you want to listen to the players, most of them. Um, have the most respect for Rod Laver. They're the one. That's the one they all go back to. Um, so you know, that's pretty good choice, really. But it's pointless, as you say, because you can't 
you can't pick and choose your uh, opponents. How much of it has got to do with, and you know, I get asked this question all the time, that's why I've saved a few, how much has got to do with these days the equipment, the rackets? I mean, I, you know, I was watching a game yesterday, I think it was uh, Rublev versus Rune, one of the serves is over 200k. I mean, and I don't know, they never measured speed, of course, back in a day, did they? But, you know, the equipment is so much better, the diet's so much better, the nutrition is so much better, the training, the physios, all of that kind of stuff. Um, the way you're treated, I mean, you get somebody holding a brolly, fetching your ball, fetching your towel, you know, you fly first class, you've got five-star hotel. Yeah, so, you know, when you add all that in, into it and then maybe retro-apply it to the players from the past, I mean, it's just mind-blowing to think what some of them could have done under today's circumstances. Do you ever think that? Well, it's amazing what they did with what they were using. I mean, you look at the old rackets. <laughs> those, well, they're like those, a club. Things, they're like a club, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, and with a tiny, tiny little sweet spot. So those guys worked out how you had to play tennis with those rackets. And by and large it was serve and volley because the courts weren't as consistent as they are now. Um, and and you couldn't rally from the baseline comfortably with those rackets for any length of time. It was just too hard to hit the sweet spot. So that era figured out how to play with those rackets. And, th and they played a different game from the guys now because the big racket that you're talking about, initially they thought uh, the big racket will just make every match serve volley point, serve volley point, serve volley point. Um, but in actual fact, uh, the guys worked out that the big rackets helped the return of serve more than the server. So that allowed people like Courier and Agassi and all of those guys to come to the fore and start winning, uh, you know, on grass courts without playing serve and volley tennis. So each era has to work out how to play with the equipment that they have. I don't know where tennis rackets are going to go in the future, but... You know, they're mighty powerful weapons now in the hands of a, a professional player. But the, the, the size of the racket, which allows those 200K serves, also allows you, if you can anticipate them, uh, to return them, and sometimes with interest. So, you know, each, each era learns to use the equipment they've got. Same with the golfers. You know, the, the, the golfers, even if you just go back to, say, Seve Ballesteros, Greg Norman, um, Sandy Lyle, those guys, the last of the the sim and driver guys, they had to work out how to manipulate, manoeuvre the ball around. And, you know, to hit hit a persimmon driver and the old Ballada balls 285 yards was a miracle. Well, now any kid out on the tour carries the ball 300 yards in the air with his driver. If he's not, he can't, he can't win a tournament. So uh, the younger kids don't play like uh, the Sandy Lyle Silly Biosteros did. But they just bomb it. And, and, you know, have a relatively short club into the, the green, no matter where they are, whether they're in the six-inch rough or in the middle of the fairway. So they figured out how to use that new equipment. And, you know, the pressure is on, I guess, on the governing bodies to make sure that, you know, we don't eventually finish up with tennis rackets or golf clubs that basically hit the ball and all you've got to do is attend at the rack and end of it, you know. So uh, it's interesting to see the development. But I, but I love the modern game just as a much as I like the old one, both in golf and, and tennis. I just, I like the way the, the pros of each era figure out how to use the equipment they, that they're allowed to use. 25-2, Graham Agars is with us. Look, I've got a few more questions. You happy staying on the line? I hope so. Sure, yeah. Graham, so, you know, we'll, get, we'll, we'll obviously discuss both the men's and women's draws at the Australian Open shortly. And outside of Novak Djokovic, though, who, ex who excites you right now as a young tennis player? Roger is retired. We saw Rafa Hoblin around the court. Goodness knows whether he's even got another tournament in him. Andy Murray, I mean, plays the old man, um, the injured old man to absolute perfection. And he's capable, but he's never going to go long into a tournament. Novak is still hanging around there. He's obviously the, the only guy probably capable of overtaking Rafa at the moment. Who excites you about the next bunch behind that? Yeah, so for the first time, we're now seeing the big four, which which crushed the, crushed the careers of a whole bunch of guys. Let's say Dimitrov's a classic example. You know, they were calling the new Fed at one stage, one-handed, backhand, all this sort of stuff. All of his era, and they're now in their 30s, they had no chance because the big four won all the majors and, and all the important tournaments. Well, now the big four's on its way out. Ruff has passed his use by date. You know, he has a medic trailing him around the court yes. to pick up the pieces <laughs> when he plays. I mean, it's, it's sad to see. Yeah, hello, and surely, uh, surely, apart from the French Open, he's, 
you got to think it's a swan song. Yeah, you got to think yeah. so. Yeah, yeah. Roger's out. Murray, Murray is playing ceremonial tennis. It's fine by me. Uh, and Novak is proving he's human. Um, you know, he's been carrying an injury, quite serious one, through the Australian Open Championship. So at 35, you know, he doesn't have a big future in front of him either. So now we're looking for the first time, uh, who are the kids are going to put up the hand? And to me, they are Tsitsipas, Medvedev, Yannick Sinner, this young Italian who's about to break through somewhere, somehow, another Italian in Berrettini, and, and the German uh, Zverev. If he can keep his head straight, um, you know, he could he can be anything. But they're the guys... What about El, El Caris? We've got to add him to the list? Um, you, you mean FAA? Yeah. Roger, Ali Asim, yeah. It's a, boy, that's a mouthful, that yeah. name. It takes no, up, no, sorry, Carlos, up, Carlos, the uh, Spaniard who won the US Open. Oh, sorry, Carlos Alcatraz. Yes. He's the one I forgot. Yes. Al, not Alcatraz, Alcaraz. Yes. yes. <laughs> I keep calling him Alcatraz. <laughs> it's not good. Um, and, and FAA, uh, Felix Auger, uh, alias Sim. You know, he's got a future as well. But um, we're going to have to see about the Spaniard. I mean, I'm worried that he's that badly hurt that early in his career. And he's a strong kid. You know, he could be a Pat Cash in the end. Uh, his body too strong for his joints. We don't know. But, you know, he's got a chance now. And I'm, I'm really disappointed he's What about the women, Australia. Graham? Because I look at Naomi Osaka, now that she's pregnant, I mean, and, and the, the struggles that she's had, I wonder whether she's ever going to come back. And if she does, whether she'd ever get to that level again. Radicanu, after winning the US Open, can't get past the second round in any major tournament since. So who, who in the women, you know, are following behind the Williams sisters and, the, and so forth? Well, I'll tell you, I was hoping for one, and that is Coco Goff. And like Raducanu, she has a problem at the moment against heavy-hitting players. They can push her off the court. Ostapenko showed how to do it in the previous round and had Coco in tears because Coco's game is great, but it, when she when she faces someone with a lot of horsepower, you know, she's just struggling to stay in, in games, stay in points, and that's disappointing. You know, she could be a huge... Um, win for the women's tour if if she could follow Serena mm. uh, and and get to the very top of the game. She's the one I, I'm watching. Now, that's not to say there's not some fantastic players out there. I mean, Schwantek is wonderful. Jabur has got uh, all the talent in the world if she can focus it. Um, there's a couple of Americans sneaking up there, like Jessica Pagula, who's probably the hardest worker in women's tennis at the moment. Uh, and, and you've got uh, players like Arena Sabalenka, who's turning out to be a pretty solid performer around the world. So the, the talent is there, but, you know, the women's tour, if they could get Coco Goff somehow to get her a bit stronger and, and, and find a way to cope with the power from the other side of the net, you know, she would be the one that could carry the women's tour for years because the kid's only 18. She's got so much development in front Lord, of her. She is 18. She's in She's been around. Viva Graham Agus is with us on the platform. Another name can I throw at you as far as the men's is this Kachanov, uh, who's just a beast, this Russian guy. He should be playing for the All Blacks. He's about six foot six. He's built like the proverbial Graham. Isn't he? You like him? Yeah. Yeah, no, I do. Um, but he, his problem is uh, staying in matches mentally uh, because, as you say, the, the game is just um, uh, horsepower everywhere and, and touch if he needs it. But, you know, his problem is hanging in big matches mentally. He's currently, I think, 18 in the world. Yeah, yeah. Um, his, game's, his game says he should be top 10, but the reason he's not, to, not to, top 10 is that he just doesn't deliver enough on the big stage. Now, he plays today against um, another of my yeah. favourite young guys. Yeah, I keep calling him Peter, but I know his name's <laughs> Sebastian. Um, <laughs> and, Look, and, he'll and be I called, sort of Peter, to... Graham, he'll be called Peter until he wins a tournament, right? Because that's his dad. That, yeah, that's it. That's true. You know, and the, and the funny thing is, um, I covered his father winning the Australian Open. I covered the the Australian Open, I think, 2018 when Seb won the Australian Junior Championship. I covered Jessica Bugul, uh, Jessica uh, Quarter when she won uh, the Women's Australian Open Golf at Royal Melbourne. And I covered Nellie Quarter when she won it at um, uh, one of the courses in Adelaide. Wow. So that the, Nellie Quarter came out with the best line ever. I told her all of this, and this is, of course, before... You know, Seb did his thing here at the Australian Open. But I said, you know, I've sort of got this thing going with the Quarter family and the Australian Open. And she said, it's funny you should mention that because the, the joke in our family is that 
if you, unless you have an Australian Open in your resume somewhere, you can't sit at the main dinner table. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. So I, that's great. I thought that was great. And I heard Sebastian say the other day that, that, that even though he's having a great Australian Open, he's barely inside the top 30 in the world. He said, I am the worst performing athlete in my family. <laughs> that's because great. Peter, Peter went that's to right. number two. Yes. His, his mother was ranked above him. Uh, Nelly's number one in golf, and Jessica was number six at one stage. So, you know, he's he's got he's got a mountain to climb in that family. All right, a couple of quick questions. We'll let you go. And thank you so much for being so generous with your time, as always. Is the Australian is the Australian Open, you know, still got it? I mean, just in terms of where it rates in tennis and world sport, it's in the perfect position, I believe, in January. It kickstarts the sporting year because there's not a lot else going on around that you can compare, you know, with it in terms of the quality, the greatest players in the world play and all of that kind of stuff. And just compare it to, to past years. Is it is it improving? Is it getting better and better and bigger and bigger? Yeah, no, it is. They're, they're pouring money into it. I mean, prize money five years ago was 20 million total. Now it's 53 million. Um, the facility is second to none. Uh, as you know, around, uh, around the world, everybody's pouring money into the stadiums, but Australia was the first one to lead the way with multiple courts with roofs on them. Uh, and the players love coming down here. It's simple. As you said, January is a great start. There's, there's always talk, you know, that it should go to March and, and uh, all of this sort of stuff, but it's not moving out of January. There are a million reasons why it needs to stay here. Uh, there's no room in the, in the, the, the tour program for it to move to March anyway. So uh, I think it's a great start of the year. If you compare uh, what it is now to what it used to be when it was in December in Kuyong, it's chalk and cheese. I mean, Kuyong was a B-grade event with a 64 draw, uh, played with a limited number of courts, and that's why people like Borg and Co. didn't bother to come down very often. But, um, you know, it's here to stay. It's, it's probably number four as far as the slams are concerned, or maybe equal three with the French Open depending on where you come from. But, it, you know, it's here to stay and it's getting bigger and better all the time. And while it has a player support, which it does, and I don't see that changing, it's going to be, well, it's Melbourne's biggest event, 900,000 people expected yeah, there this year. Mm. Who wins it then? Who wins the men's and who wins the women's finally then? Well, um, I, I, I picked Djokovic coming in. No genius there. But, of course, the hamstring injury, you know, severely shook that. Um, but uh, against... Uh, uh, Dimano last night, um, and Djokovic was imperious and seemed to have been moving pretty well. And he says, he thinks the leg, guardedly, he's saying he thinks the leg is okay. If the leg's okay, he wins. If not, um, maybe sits the pass. And, and if you want an outsider, let's go with um, Sebi Korda. That would be just a fantastic story and could save the tournament, really, after all the upsets that have occurred. And the women, I've got no idea. Um, the top seed left is. Um, Jessica Pagula, the American, um, I'm, I'm sort of leaning towards Sabalenka at this stage, but, you know, it's wide open for any one of those girls to come through. What an absolute pleasure. So good to reconvene with you, mate. We look forward to talking again through the year about all, but mainly golf and mainly tennis. Thank you, Gray. Really appreciate it. Yeah, th thanks, mate. I appreciate it too. Well, what a wonderful chat there's. I've been so looking forward to that um, for a week or so, getting Graham organised. Uh, as I said, if you've ever been a fan or listened to Radio Sport back in the day, uh, Graham was always with us. Covers the, I mean, we always thought he had the most fabulous job in the world. Grand Slams and major golf championships.